things that we need to remember. Well, that's all I want to talk about this morning is remembering. Turn your Bibles to the book of Joshua. Joshua chapter 4. Joshua chapter 4, the leadership in Israel has changed. And uh, Moses, or excuse me, yes, Moses went up into the mountain and he died. And he passed on his leadership to young Joshua. Well, maybe not so young at this point anymore, but Joshua was young when he began following Moses, right? It had been 40 years now, so I guess Joshua himself was in his 60s uh, when Israel walked into uh, the promised land. And uh, so what was the first thing that they had to do? They had to cross the Jordan River uh, to come into the land of promise. That was the, the first thing that they had to do. And it's something that they should have done 40 years prior. So it's one of those bittersweet instances, isn't it? Uh, where Joshua's like, well, it's about time, or we're finally getting here. And so we know the story. Many of us know the story. So they took the Ark of the Covenant that Israel carried with them, and it went before them all through the time that they had in the wilderness, and they followed it. And the, it said that the, the priests, the Levites, took the, the Ark of the Covenant, and they would carry this thing with poles, so they, and it was exact, like they knew exactly how long the poles had to be, everything was formal, everything was exactly right. So they lifted this thing up, and it said when their feet touched the edge of the water, that the waters of the Jordan River parted, just like the Red Sea had parted for them. Almost as if God is reminding them of 40 years prior, right? He's saying, you know what I did for you 40 years ago in the Red Sea? I can still do that. God was the same God in this instance here as he was 40 years prior. God didn't change. Oh, if you look at the, the, the people of Israel, a lot had changed. The people who were there crossing over in Jordan, many of them who were not, well, all of them who were over the age of 20, with the exception of two people, were no longer there. And the rest of them that could remember were very, very young uh, when they failed to, to go into the land before. So a lot of things had changed in Israel or with the people of Israel, but nothing changes with God, does it? He is the same eternal God that we have. And so I want to start in Joshua chapter 4. We're going to read the first seven verses here. So bear with us. It's kind of a you know longer read a little bit. But we'll read this here in Joshua chapter 4, beginning of verse 1. It says, And it came to pass, when all the people were clean passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take you twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe, a man, and command ye them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones. And ye shall carry them over with you, and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. Then Joshua called the twelve men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe, Amen. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan, and take ye up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel, that this may be a sign among you. That when your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them, That the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord, when it passed over Jordan. The waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, we come before you. Lord, we just thank you so much for your word, and we ask that your word we do is exactly what you intended it to do. And God, that is open our hearts up and affect it. God, we came this morning to hear from you. So we ask that you would speak to us and that our hearts and our minds would be open. We pray these things in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So as we look at this story, we see what happens here is that, you know, of course, we know that the priests went down to the water. And as soon as they touched the water, their feet touched the water, the water stopped. Jordan River was opened up and the people crossed through on what? dry ground. That's right. That word is important, isn't it? A lot of people try to say, oh, well, you know, when they crossed the Red Sea, it was a swampy area. So it really wasn't dry ground. No, it says dry ground in the Red Sea. It says dry ground here. And it says that the, the Jordan River was stopped. And so as the people were passing through, God decided to have a conversation with Joshua, right? 
And so he tells him to do some specific things. And then in the end, I love that it sees there, it says that it shall be a memorial unto the children of Israel for the next three to five weeks or for the next month or two months, right? It says for how long? Forever. He says this needs to be a memorial to the children of Israel forever. And if you want something to last, right, what do you do? Does anybody remember the thing that people used to do with the, the, the parents used to do with their children's first baby shoes? They would have them bronzed. That's right. They would have them bronzed and then put on a little plaque and with that child's name. And you'd be like, why would, why would parents do that? Because parents are just weird, <laughs> right? And you just want to hold on to those little teeny tiny baby shoes as long as you possibly can. So you bronze them so it, it, it secures them to stay longer. Because we know that if you just kept those baby shoes laying around in a drawer somewhere, what eventually would happen to them? <laughs> You're probably right. Because they would break down, they'd get all, if you guys didn't hear that, a young person said they're going in the trash, <laughs> right? Probably, it's probably the young person whose baby shoes they were. They're like, why does mom still have these? And then you throw them away without mom's knowledge or permission. And then mom comes back and finds them and what happens? Bad things. We'll just say bad things, right? <laughs> But it's funny how people want to, you know, they, they want to have that memorial. And we have like Memorial Day. You realize that the first Memorial Day, it wasn't even called Memorial Day. All right. But it was, it was founded after the Civil War. I think it was 1860. I'm going to be wrong on the date, but somewhere around 1868 or 69, I think, uh, was when they started doing that. And it was a time for them to, to honor those who had given their life in the Civil War. And then, of course, we know later on down the road, we also had a, you know, we had other wars, but ultimately in, in the early 1900s, World War I or the Great War is what it was called. And then it was sometime after that, that it was Memorial Day was changed. Now, they also gave it a date. It was May 31st. It was always like May 31st. And then after that, they said, you know what, not just to honor those in the Civil War, but we need to honor all those who gave their life uh, defending the freedoms of the United States. Hence, Memorial Day was born. And so it's that time of year that we take and we say, you know what, we're going to sit back now. If you have been driving around much, what do you see everywhere on Memorial Day? You see flags. And if you drive by a cemetery, what do you see a lot of times on cemetery, at, a, at a cemetery? Not just flags, but what else? Flowers or wreaths, right? They'll place wreaths or flowers on graves. And so that's what you'll do. That's what people do. Why? Because it's a time of remembrance is what it is. It's a time of remembrance for them to say, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to take this time and we're going to go back and we're going to remember those who paid the ultimate sacrifice for us. Now I know that some people will put flowers and things on graves of loved ones, relatives, that kind of stuff. We understand that. But as far as Memorial Day is concerned, it's the time for us to remember those who have fallen defending this country. That's what it is. And so that's what people do because they say, we want to make sure that we have this time of remembrance. And so why, why do you see all the flags and the flowers and the wreaths and all this? Because those are pictures of, hey, we remembered. We remembered and we honored. So what was Israel commanded to do? They were commanded to get some stones, weren't they? Uh, to get some stones and to build some with it. But I want to take, just kind of break this story down for you and see about remembering God. Why it's important for us to remember God. Because I'm here to also tell you, without God this country would be nothing. Now think about that now, especially in light of kind of where our country's at nowadays. Uh, I mentioned this yesterday. I read a story and it was about North Korea. And they were talking about Christians in North Korea and how Christians in North Korea are severely just persecuted. It's horrible. Uh, it really is very bad. And how that, uh, you know, they're, they're in hiding. It's very difficult for them to even talk to someone else about Jesus Christ. Uh, there was an entire family that was thrown in prison because they were worshiping God because they had a Bible in their house. And one of the members of that family was a two-year-old child thrown in prison for life. They were without, and this is not the United States. You don't get to appeal this conviction. They were thrown into prison for life, an entire family, because of that. There was another man who was publicly beaten to death in front of everyone because he was praying to God. And there's been countless others who have been persecuted, imprisoned, and killed because of their Christian beliefs. And I'm reading this story 
and it's on like a major news, you know, uh, app that, that, you know, that just kind of puts out these stories and things like that. Now, you know what I always like to do at the end of a news story as well, right? Because for some odd reason, people think, well, we need to have a spot where people can make comments because what people think is important. Or what people want to say is important. Now, I, when I was taught to grow up, I was taught, you know, children should, uh, what, be seen and not heard. That's what I was told. Or if I went up and said something to one of my parents and they were in a conversation, I would either get a snap or a finger. And they would just, uh, that was stop talking because I'm in the middle of a conversation. Adults are talking right now. You be quiet right? What I wanted, what I thought, what I wanted to say, it wasn't that important. But nowadays, everything that every, every thought that enters into someone's mind is important and you need to make a place for it on the internet. So I went down to the comment section at the end of this story. And you know what I found written by United States, American citizens, people living right here in the good old US of A, countless countless, countless comments about how bad Christianity is. That's, I was astounded at it. I, I was reading, they said, well, that just makes up for all the evil that missionaries did when they would go and try to proselytize these other nations. Well, if you think that's bad, you know, just imagine what Christians, and it was always Christians, and one of them referenced like, you know, the, the, you know the, I can't remember, it was like this and priests and this and that. I said, okay, we need, to, we need to differentiate between Catholicism and Christianity, all right? Because I would not call Catholicism Christianity in any way, shape, or form because they don't necessarily follow God, do they? They follow, and things that have been done in, for the sake of Catholicism was completely different. But I was just like in awe as I read just post after post and comment after comment saying that Christians were no better than the North Koreans, executing and killing people, that's what it was. And that's the country we live in. Do you know why? Because we live in a country that has forgotten God. And I don't say that to depress you this morning. I say that to tell you it's important that we don't forget God. So very quickly, I just want to look at a few things here for Israel when God said, remember me. Remember me. The first thing is there was a command to remember. There was a command to remember. Verses 1 through 3 says that it came to pass when all the people were clean, passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying, Take ye twelve men out of the people, out of every tribe of man, and command ye them, saying, Take you hence out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, and ye shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where ye shall lodge this night. Where did that command come from? It came from God. God went to Joshua and God said, Joshua, this is what I want you to do. Now, normal people would look at that and say, how arrogant. Okay, but it's God. Is God being arrogant? No, he's God and he deserves all that worship, honor, glory, and praise. He deserves it. So when he says, this is what I want you to do for me, for my name's sake, so that the people remember this, it's not wrong. And it's not wrong for us to say, it, you need to remember God. Let me tell you something. It's not wrong to walk into other countries. Well, we got our loaves and fishes, right? We talked about that, the missionaries that we support. It is not wrong to walk into other countries and say, thus saith the Lord. Because what someone else thinks or feels, or wants to post up on the internet, is not even close to being as important as what God says. Because he is truly God. And above him, there is no other. We worship the risen and true king, don't we? And there's no one else. So when God speaks, we should what? Listen. We should listen. And that's where it came from. This command came from God. God says, I want you to set up a memorial. I want you to do this thing for me. And not, for, not necessarily just for his sake either. But so that the people would what? Remember. So that the people would remember. You know, there's, it scares me because I feel like there's going to be coming a time in our country where we look around and we're going to see fewer and fewer churches. I was reading that the, the, the uh, United Methodist Church has lost of like a million members or something like that, or almost a million members now. 
over the last several years. The, the Southern Baptist Convention has lost over a million members in the last several years. And it's just, just decline after decline after decline. Why is that? It's because people have forgotten God. People have forgotten God. And when you have these large organizations that say, you know what, well, we're going we're gonna to be more inclusive. And we're going to do this and we're going to do that. And they take God out of it and they try to do this. Well, of course there's problems with that. Well, of course there's going to be issues because you remove God from what you are. How do you function as the body of Christ? How does the church function as the body of Christ when they want to remove God from that body? That doesn't even make any sense. You know, that's like going to the doctor and the doctor says, we need to perform an operation. Oh no, what do you got to do? We're going to remove all of you. What do you mean? We're going to actually, or, or they say, well, we've got this just, it's now it's a little bit crazy procedure, but it's, it's very new and it's very cutting edge. We're going to remove your soul from your body. What happens when our soul leaves our body? The body's dead, right? You're like, so you're going to kill me. That's what you're going to do. That's literally what churches are doing to themselves today. They're removing their very soul, God, from that body and what's left, just a dead organism. That's all it is. It may not know it yet, but it's dead because it is all about God. So that command to remember came from God. The second thing, as we see, is there was obedience. They obeyed. There was obedience by the leaders, verse 4 and 5. The immediate response of Joshua is an important thing. Joshua immediately says, Then Joshua, verse 4, called the 12 men whom he had prepared of the children of Israel out of every tribe a man. So immediately Joshua went and what? Got 12 volunteers. Got 12 volunteers. I don't know how he did it. It just says the men that he prepared. Maybe he just walked around and he looked for the biggest, strongest guy. You're like, you know, he comes up. Hey, you know, how much can you bench press? Right? Maybe that's what, that's what Joshua asked him. I don't know what Joshua asked him. He looked at him and said, hey, flex your arm for me. All right, you're good. Come on. Because what was their job going to be? They had to go pick up rocks. It's not like he was looking for like the weakest person either, right? But he goes and gets 12 men. These men probably not only were they probably, you know, physically able to do it. They were probably also leaders in the tribes. Because he didn't just go pick anybody. He picked leaders in the tribes. So he goes and he picks these 12 men. Verse 5, and Joshua said unto them, pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan. You say, why did they have to pass over the ark in Jordan? Remember what's going on. What's going on in this very moment is that the people are passing over. The priests have not yet come across and stopped. They're still standing in the Jordan. The river is still stopped. The waters are still parted. And Joshua says, hey, before we finish what we're doing... I need to get you 12 guys together, and I need want you guys to go down. Go past where the priests are. Go down into the, into the innermost, the bottom of the river. That's what he tells them to do. Go into the bottom of the river, right? He says, pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan, and take ye up every man of you a stone upon his shoulder, according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel. So there's 12 of them standing there. Each one of you guys has got to get a rock. Now, can you imagine being on that team? Got to get a rock. I got to make sure my rock's a good rock kind of rock do I want? Do you want it to be round? Do you want it to be this or that? Now they knew what they were going to do, but each one of them had a job to go back into the middle of that river and pluck a rock. Now they weren't like digging around in the wet. Where were they getting their rocks from? The dry ground. So there was only a certain end. Now it's not like that was a small area either. You're thinking, oh, it's as wide as this aisle probably is where they were at. We're talking about the entire right? Nation of Israel, the, all of the people of Israel walked across that river. I'm pretty sure it was wider than this. It was probably even wider than our building is wide. So there was an area for them to go down and start searching. And here are the priests standing here holding the Ark of the Covenant while these guys are picking up rocks out of the middle of the river. But they obeyed God. Folks, if a church is going to be what God wants it to be, and if we're going to, to remember our God, and we're going to, to be able to hold him up to the esteem that he needs to be held up to, what's the first thing we need to do? We need to obey. We need to listen to our God and obey. That's what we need to do. Because without obedience from God's people, without obedience from God's church, we need to obey as a church, but make that personal to your life. Don't say, well, the church will be fine, and I just get, no, you're a part of this body. 
God wants you to listen and obey to him. Right? Obey what he says. Obey what he does. We obey that. There was no, it didn't say, well, Joshua thought about it for a day and a half while the priest stood there. No, as soon as the people were done, God told Joshua what to do. And Joshua turned and said, I need to get 12 men. Now he's out on this mission, rounding up 12 guys from the 12 tribes. Then he gets them together and says, I need every one of you guys to go back into the river. Go past the priest, go past the ark, go back into the middle of the river. And you guys find me 12 rocks. Now, when it says stones, don't think they were little stones. It's not like they were doing the whole, you know, new age thing. And we're going to stack up these 12 little stones here. And it's going to, no, that's not there. We're going to balance them and it's going to be beautiful. Right? I mean, what do you do every time you see one of those things? You just kind of want to, right? You're like, come on. Why, why, why do you do that? People do that everywhere now. Like they'll go to, they'll go out to, you know, the Grand Canyon. You'll see these rocks all stacked up. And one of these days, there's going to be some scientist that says, this is proof of evolution. <laughs> because these rocks just fell on top. And you're like, no, it's definitely intelligent design, all right? Because these rocks wouldn't have stacked by themselves. It's going to start a whole debate. I can just see that happening down the road. But that's, that's not what he's talking about. These were stones that were big enough that they had to put them on their backs. That's what he says, put them on your backs. But they obeyed. And these guys went down in there and they gathered these rocks. And they stacked started to stack them up. They brought them back and they began to stack them up. Why? That leads us to the next one because it was important that they teach the next generation. So we see there that God gave them a command, right? We see that they obeyed. Well, why was it important for them to obey? So that the next generation could see and understand because you know what? There would come a generation that didn't walk across that Jordan River. They didn't see the waters parted. And you say, man, if I'd have saw those waters parted, you tell that to the rest of Israel that died after the Red Sea. They saw the waters parted. They saw what God did. And yet when they got to the promised land, they said, what? We can't do this. We can't do this. Well, I'm sorry that we can't do this is a problem not with God, but with man. Because now you're limiting God and you're making him a man. And you're saying, well, this is impossible. God's like, for me, nothing is impossible. It's like that old hymn, all things, or nothing is impossible when you put your trust in God. Right? Nothing is impossible when you're trusting in his word. That's how the song goes. Is there anything that is impossible for God? No, the Bible tells us that. That nothing is impossible for God. But it would behoove us to have a, a, a memorial, a remembrance for a future generation. It's important for us to say, I saw God work. I, I had God work in my heart, in my life. I had God do this. I saw what God can do with this church. And let me tell you, young people, God can do the same with you. God can do the same with you. I, I, I heard somebody say one time, they're like, you know, all the, the, the good generation is gone or they're fading fast. I'm sure they said that about, you know, that generation. When they were young, they were like, well, the good generation is gone. They're fading fast. And yet, the, and those were the, if you don't know, the greatest generation, they say the greatest generation is the one that lived during World War II. They know a lot of those guys that fought in there and everything else. You know, on this Memorial Day, it's what we do. But you know what? God can still use people to do the same thing. You say, well, where are all the Billy Sundays and, and where are all the, you know, all these great preachers and the John R. Rices and this and that? God's still working on the same hearts. You just got to let God be God and let him do that. Don't look, folks, it'd be dangerous for us as, as older people. All right. Um, I have white hair. I'm an older, older people. All right. It'd be dangerous for us as older people to look at our younger people and say, God can't do anything with them. Who do we think we are? No, it is not our job to judge whether God can or cannot do something with that young person. It is our responsibility to make sure that young person is reminded of who God is. And when we remind them who God is, God can do what he wants with them. Look at what it says. I want you to drop all the way down to verse 20 in this chapter 4. And this is kind of like almost a repetitive part. Because he says there that in verse 6 that it's going to be a sign among you that when your children ask their father in time to come saying, what well, shall mean you by these stones? Then you shall answer them. In verse 7, this is what you're going to tell them. Same thing in verse 20 through 23. It says, and those 12 stones which they took out of Jordan did Joshua pitch in Gilgal. 
And he spake unto the children of Israel, saying, When your children shall ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean these stones? Then ye shall let your children know, saying, Israel came over this Jordan on dry land. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of Jordan from before you until ye were passed over, as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up from before us until we were gone over. He says, you know what you're going to tell them? You're going to tell them what God did. That's what you're going to do. You're going to tell them that God dried up the water, that the land, the, the, the dirt, the earth that we crossed on was dry. There was water on one side, water on the other side. And where we were at, there was nothing. We walked across on dry ground. I don't even think fish were flopping. I don't. Now, I think if a fish was flopping, it'd be wet. It said it was dry. I don't think that happened at all. I think God said everything move. And everything moved. When they crossed the Red Sea, God said, everything moved. And everything moved. And they were able to walk across in that miracle and see what God had did. Folks, I'm telling you right now, God is still parting Red Seas. He's still parting Jordan rivers. And he's still leading his people into his promise. That's what he does. And we need to remember that. And we need to be teaching that to future generations. Because they need to hear what God does. They need to hear who God is. And they need to see a people that believes in our God. Not a people that says, well, you know, who cares? Christians are just as bad as, as the, the communist dictatorship in North Korea. Yes, I, I, I've been hung up on that. I can't get past it. You know why? Because it's this country that's saying it. And you know what it tells me? That this country needs to see Jesus Christ. That's what it needs. Because we, we're going to have a generation that knows not God and thinks that God's not important, that God doesn't matter, and that what you want, what you have, everything, you just, you live your life how you want to live your life, and you don't care about anything else. Care about what God says is important. Care about what Jesus Christ says is important. And care about what his word says. Because if we don't live by this word, we've missed it, haven't we? And that's what we need to be teaching to our younger generation, showing them, I believe in God. And I've trusted him in my life. Let me tell you something, what God did for me. Because you can't deny that. Let me tell you what God did for me. Let me tell you the miracle that I saw God do. That's why I encourage everybody, man, if you ever get a chance you know, to go on a mission trip or go out there, I, I wish we, you know, we, we've had, we haven't had a trip in a while. Darren and I are talking, we're going we're gonna to have another one. We're going to have mission trip. But you know what? I encourage everybody to go on a mission trip. You know why? Because when you go there, you get to see God work. Not because God doesn't work here. Because you go with the mentality of, I want to see God work. You realize that that's literally the only biggest difference between going on a mission trip out there and being here. You leave with the mentality of, I can't wait to see God work. It'd be interesting to walk into church with the mentality of, I can't wait to see God work. Most of us walk into church with the mentality, I'm going to be rough here. Most of us walk into church with the mentality of, when are we going to get done? Because I got a roast in the oven. That's what it is, isn't it? It's like, oh, man, wait, is, he, is he done yet? What time is it? Hurry up. I'm thinking the same thing myself. Hurry up. I told somebody before, I was like, you know, hey, if you catch me sleeping during the message, just elbow me. You know, I was like, is that preacher sometimes? It's not that exciting. But our God is sure, sure is exciting, isn't he? And let me tell you something. We need to be giving him to the next generation and teaching him the next generation and shouting his praises and saying what he has done. So he said, stack these stones up where you camp. That's where they left those stones, right near the Jordan River where they came across and they camped on the other side. You know why? So generations could come back and say, you know what those represent? Those represent what God has done. You know what this church represents? This church represents what God has done. That's what it is because 40 years from now, there's going to be a whole lot of different faces in this church if God tarries is coming. Right? 40 years from now, it'll be a whole lot different. Some of the young people are like, I'll be like 55. That's so old. And some of you are going, I wish I was 55 again. <laughs> right? Wouldn't that be nice? But let me tell you something. Things are going to be different, but what God has done remains the same. And it needs to be a memorial for those generations coming behind us. One more quick thing here, the last one. 
Not only was it for their young people, but verse 24 tells us that it was a testimony to all the earth. Because it's not just for us. It's for the entire earth. It says there in verse 24 that all the people of the earth might know the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty, that ye might fear the Lord your God forever. There's nothing like a good old dose of, of healthy God fear in there. Boy, he is God. He sits on a throne. He's the one that can destroy the soul and the spirit, not just the body. And if God chose for his creation to end today, that would be it for us. There would be no heaven or hell. There would be no, uh, you know, wandering. There would be nothing. There would be no existence if God chose it. And he could, with a snap of his fingers, end everything. But that's not what he promised. And we know God is a God. Of, you say, why would you say that? That's not God. Because he promised. But it doesn't mean he doesn't have that power. He is a great and mighty God. He is a God to be feared. He is a wonderful God. He is a God to be worshipped. Truly worshipped. And we, as his church, are his memorial for all those around us. Why do we put John and Romans together? Why do we support our missionaries? Why do we make it a point to do all the ministries that we do so that outside this church, the world that we live in, this world that wants to reject Christianity, this world that wants to tear down Christianity, this world that says, I want to do what I want to do and I don't care about anything else, they need to see God. And we have to be that testimony. You know what I'm here to tell you right now? That the Lee Summit Baptist Temple is a memorial for God. It is. We are his memorial. When people walk into this church, they need to see God. And we need to tell them what God has done and what God is doing and what God's going to do. Because the world needs to hear it. You want the world changed? We change it with God. That's what we do. We change it with God. Back